si les parece. Bien, eh, bienvenidos un día más a este ciclo de aula mediterránea del, del IEMED. Eh, vamos a proceder hoy a la segunda conferencia que dentro del ciclo organiza el Máster en Estudios Internacionales de la Universidad de Barcelona. Y en esta ocasión hemos eh, invitado al doctor Camel Toraí. Él es eh, investigador del Centro Nacional de Investigación eh, Científica de Francia y dentro de este centro está eh, destinado en el Instituto de Estudios de Oriente Próximo. Él es geógrafo como formación de origen, con especialización también en sociología y es experto en migraciones internacionales. Y en este ámbito ha trabajado en eh, diferentes eh, centros de investigación en eh, Jordania, Siria y actualmente está en el Líbano, trabajando, como digo, temas de migraciones internacionales y también de refugiados y demandantes de asilo. Eh, le hemos pedido hoy que centre su intervención en uno de los temas eh, de su especialidad, que en relación con eh, los palestinos refugiados, eh, fundamentalmente ahora actualmente trabaja con, con, en, te, en, en relación a los palestinos refugiados en, eh, en, el, eh, en el Líbano, y eh, en relación con el conflicto sirio y la eh, esa evolución del concepto de refugiado a, a demandantes de asilo. Eh, muchas gracias por aceptar nuestra invitación en participar en este ciclo de conferencias. Él va a impartir su eh, charla en inglés, pero creo que entiende el castellano. Sí, sí, entiendo, pero es muy difícil hablar 45 minutos, minutos en, en castellano. Gracias no, mucho. So thanks really for the invitation and um, well, I, I will just um, give you a brief introduction on, on the question of, of, of refugees and asylum in the Middle East and then I will go through um, a case study uh, that is the case of the Palestinian refugees uh, from Syria who are now seeking asylum in, in other countries because of the um, current situation and the current war uh, in Syria. Well, I, I decided to, to focus on this specific aspect. It's, um, it's more than a case study uh, because it gives us some uh, elements to understand the overall situation of the uh, refugees and asylum seekers in the Middle East. Um, because if it shed light on a very specific situation, that the one of the Palestinians, it also gives some elements for a wider ref reflection on what is a refugee today, and what is more specifically a refugee in, in, in a region where the countries are not signatory of the Geneva Convention of 1951, Geneva Convention on, on Refugee Rights. And, and also because of the multiplication of conflicts uh, and wars uh, in the region, um, it's also a question uh, for those who are working on the question of refugees, asylum seekers, and mobility. What happens to a refugee where his country of asylum becomes at war, and then he had to leave a second time his country of asylum, being already a refugee? So what does it mean all today? Does it mean anything to seek asylum where you are already a recognized refugee? Uh, how can we go from one category to another? So it's a whole overall reflection on the categories, and I think one of the elements that is quite interesting uh, uh, when we, we, we look a little bit in details what happens in the Middle East, it's quite close to what is happening in Europe. Uh, if we witness all the difficulties that have the politicians or the journalists or even the researchers uh, to put some of these people who move in a category. It's a refugee crisis, it's a migrant crisis in Europe. Are these people refugees already? Are these people asylum seekers? Are these people migrants? Are they illegal migrants? And so uh, in this presentation, I will try to go through these different categories and try to show on, with one case study uh, all the different aspects and, and probably some of the ways to, to try to get out of these uh, problems of categorization. 
and how, when looking at a situation in the Middle East, it can help us to understand uh, um, in other contexts. It can be in Europe, but it can be anywhere else. Uh, the question of relation between mobility, asylum, and, uh, and refugees. Um, so I will first begin with a more broad introduction on uh, the situation of asylum uh, in the Middle East. Well, most of you must know this. Um, it's, it's a region that is famous now to, for sending a lot of refugees outside of the region towards other countries, and especially Europe, Northern America, and, um, and Australia. And it's also a region since World War II that is known for having protracted conflict. Uh, of course, there have been uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict since 1948, uh, but also several wars in Iraq, Iran-Iraq war, and then the American invasion in 91. You have the, the war in Yemen, of course, the civil war in Lebanon in the 70s and in the 80s. Uh, so you have several different kinds of, of, uh, of wars, and of course in the Kurdistan at the east of Turkey. So all these wars have generated huge movements of population. And so we are in a region where it's one of the highest percentage of refugees in the world if we compare it to the population. Just to give you a few numbers, if we take the Palestinians, those who left what has become in 1949 Israel, 90% uh, of the Palestinians left the countries, left what has became Israel. So only 10% of the Palestinians stayed in what has become Israel later on. If we take today the Syrian conflict, it's on a population, on a total population of around 20 million. It's more than 5 million refugees abroad and between 5 and 7 million displaced inside the country. So it means that more than one Syrian on two is displaced inside his country or abroad. So it's huge, huge numbers of refugees. On the legal context, I will just say a few words because I will go more in details uh, uh, with the Palestinian situation. Uh, uh, we are in a, facing a paradox. It's a region where you have one of the biggest refugee population in the world, in, in, in the world but all the countries are not signatory of the 1951 Geneva Convention on Refugees. So we have a lot of refugees, but no refugee, legal ref category of refugee in the country. So there is no asylum system. So the, U the UNHCR acts in this country as the administration who gives or not the refugee status. But the, there is no asylum law as such in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Syria. And it's also the only region in the world where you have a specific agency, the UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestine Refugees, that is specific only to one category of refugees, to one group of refugees. There is no other situation in the world. So you have a UN agency who works only for one population, that is a Palestinian refugee population. It has been created in 49, and it still exists until now. So it means that the role of the state, of the different host states in the region, is extremely important because they give the legal framework to take these refugees on their territory and to give them rights or not of residency, access to the labor market, access to the uh, public services. So this is quite peculiar and very specific uh, to the region. And for example, the uh, League of the Arab State doesn't have any kind of reflection on the question of asylum or refugee law. So there is no, nothing in the Arab League on this question. 
Another element that is often uh, described as being extremely important is the perception that this region is a transit region towards Europe. And this is a concern for most of the European countries that try to develop tools, instruments of cooperation to avoid uh, the re-emigration of refugees towards Turkey, towards Libya, uh, to enter the European Union. Um, so uh, it's not the last. I, I okay. I thought that it was a, a map. Uh, okay, so it's not the good version. Um, but I just wanted to say that it's only a very limited number of refugees uh, uh, cross the uh, EU borders. More than 90% of them stay in the Middle East, in the neighboring countries. So, for example, uh, during the so-called um, migrant crisis in 2015 in the EU, it was less than one million people who entered, and on them, something like half a million were Syrians. It means that less than th those who were in one single country, uh, like Jordan or like uh, Lebanon. Jordan has 600,000 Syrians, and Lebanon has one million for a population of four million. So it's very, very limited of number who managed to cross, who even are willing to cross to Europe. Most of them want to go back to their country to return and not to re-emigrate to, uh, to third country. So the idea that they will re-emigrate, that the idea is that, it, it, that the Middle East is a transit region uh, uh, towards uh, 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 European Union is more or less false, and most of the refugees, they stay uh, in the country where they have found asylum in the Middle East. So it's mostly a question of, it's a regional problem more than an intra-regional uh, uh, problem uh, between Middle East and, and, uh, and Europe. The situation also is very, uh, and, and it can be uh, shown very, uh, very practically with the example of, of a country like Jordan. I will not develop the example of Jordan today a lot, but I think that it's a very interesting uh, country. It's a country of uh, 9 million inhabitants, and um, according to the statistics produced by Jordan, uh, around half of the population is from Palestinian origin. So you have like 50% of people who are from refugee origin. And you have to add the Iraqis, who immigrated post-91 and post-2003, and you have to add also now the Syrians. So more than half of the, of, the, of the population in Jordan are refugees or from refugee origin. And a city like Amman, that is now around 3.5 million inhabitants, was a small village in 1948 before the arrival of the uh, Palestinians. It was like 30,000 inhabitants. And Amman has been created by a refugee population coming from Chechenia. So it's already a city, a village that was created by migrants uh, during the Ottoman Empire and then became the capital of the, uh, of the country, of the kingdom, and grown with the different waves of refugees. And now we have Syri uh, Palestinian neighborhoods, Iraqi neighborhoods, Syrian neighborhoods, and now with the war in Yemen, you have more and more Yemenis also that are coming. So this is to have in mind that the overall context is that the refugee movements are one of the bases of some of the, uh, uh, of the societies in the Middle East. And so most of them are not re-emigrating, but rather they stay and they build and they became part of the society. The situation, more specifically, that I will uh, uh, talk today is on the Palestinians in Syria. So just a few elements to have in mind that be before 2011. So uh, the Palestinians in Syria were not a new population. They arrived mostly in 1948 and in 1967 with the two biggest war uh, between Palestinians and Israel. And uh, there was around half a million of Palestinians living in Syria before 2011, mostly concentrated in the main cities, uh, in the main neighborhoods. You have several refugee camps, official ones. 
and many, many big neighborhoods that were not officially refugee camps, but where the population of Palestinians were uh, a, a majority, uh, like uh, the famous Yarmouk camp, probably you heard about it in 2012. It had been destroyed by the Syrian army and led to one of the biggest exodus of Palestinians that are now in Lebanon or in, uh, in Jordan. According to the recommendation of the Arab League, uh, the Palestinians have no political rights in Syria, but they were treated uh, as Syrian citizens for all the rest. They have access to the labor market, they have access to public schools, to the public employment, uh, to education, like all the Syrians. So it was one of the states that discriminated the less the Palestinians. They were more or less considered as Syrian citizens, the only thing they didn't have is the right to vote, but in Syria it was not like the main issue, of course, before 2011 and even today. So it was only they had no political rights, so they were still stateless, so no nationality, no passport. So they have a travel document issued by the uh, Syrian authority that uh, give them the opportunity or the possibility to travel uh, abroad, but with a lot of restrictions, of course. So this was the situation of the Palestinians in Syria before 2011. Um, to put this into the overall context of the Palestinian refugee question, well, today uh, the mass exodus of Syrians uh, leads us to ignore or to put a little bit aside the question of the, the Palestinian refugees as if it was something that was belonging to the past and was not still existing as a, as a problem. Uh, but just to give you a few elements for those who would not really familiar with the Palestinian refugee question, it's today it's still 58 official refugee camps in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, in Jordan, in Syria, and in Lebanon. So it's a huge number of refugees, a huge number of refugee camps that are still run by the UNRWA. Around 20% of the refugees still lives since 1948 or 1967 in a refugee camp. So they are still in this refugee camp. And I will just show you at the end of this presentation some pictures uh, uh, of the current situation today and later on some how did, does this refugee camp have evoluted. It's part of the uh, of cities now. And one of the biggest problem of the Palestinians today, it's since 1948, most of them are stateless. It's the biggest stateless refugee population in the world. They have no nationality. It means that they have no rights. And they rely on the documents given by the state where they live. So they, are, they have travel documents that allow them to circulate, but they are discriminated in terms that they ha don't, doesn't have any access to free circulation in the Middle East or anywhere else because they don't have a passport. These two maps, uh, I, I did them it's a few years ago, but uh, the situation didn't really change since 2003 in terms of, of numbers. But it's in, in 58, it's where most of the refugee camps were created. Uh, and so the population, the Palestinian population, 10 years after 48, were settled. And you can see on the map, there are no real differences except that the number of refugees camp have, of the refugee camps have increased because of the 67 uh, war. But you can see that. Since 48, the same refugee camp are existing. It's just that the numbers of refugees is growing year by year. Uh, so the Palestinian refugee camp are, I mean, show to the international community that this uh, situation is not solved. And uh, these are some photos uh, of the evolution of one of these refugee camps. So this is in Jordan. It's in. Um, the northern part of Amman. It's one of the biggest. It was a long, for a long, during a long time, it was the biggest refugee camp in the world. And now it's Dadaab in Kenya that is the biggest one for Somalis. Uh, but this camp has been one of the biggest one in the world. It's nearly 100,000 inhabitants, so it's a city in itself. 
And so it was tense, and step by step it has developed into a city. Um, we can call it a makeshift city, we can call it, it's informal, of course. Uh, it's not like a real city with services, with, uh, it's marked by informality, it's not very different from very poor neighborhoods all around Jordan, but it's, it shows to you uh, because when we talk about refugees, we have, the we have more or less the image of the first uh, image. We see like a refugee camp that is kind of emergency uh, uh, answer or uh, practical answer to, to, uh, to uh, an emergency, a humanitarian emergency. But it's, I mean, it transforms into cities. Uh, and what is very specific is that these uh, neighborhoods are governed by specific laws. So they do not, they are not integrated in uh, the urban planning, for example. They still rely on specific uh, uh, regulation uh, 70 years later. Another very famous place, I don't know if the photos are very clear, but it's um, Shatila Camp. Shatila Camp is very famous for the uh, Sabra and Shatila massacres in 1982, where hundreds of Palestinians were uh, uh, killed um, during the uh, Lebanese civil war and Israeli invasion. And uh, so the camp was destroyed many times since its creation. And the last photos I took them, it's like uh, a few months ago. So um, it looks like now it's like a neighborhood. If you cannot see anything in the photo in the middle, it's just because of the uh, uh, the infra I mean, the, the buildings are so close one to each other that even the sunlight doesn't enter uh, down. So it's a, uh, it's a very specific, it's extremely dense and extremely poor neighborhood. So this is the situation of the Palestinians since, uh, uh, since 1948, and it's pockets of poverty and uh, uh, pockets of, um, of, of marginalization inside the uh, society. Concerning the, the situation today of the Palestinian refugees from Syria, as I told you, uh, around 500,000 were living in Syria. Around half of them are displaced internally, and uh, 120,000 are uh, now abroad, they left. Uh, most of them to Lebanon, and some of them to Jordan some of them to Turkey, some of them to, to Iraq, and some of them they left to European countries. Um, the specificity of these um, Palestinians is that it's not the first time it happens that the Palestinians are caught in a conflict. Uh, as you may know, since 1948, uh, Palestinians uh, were expelled many times for the country of residence. Just a few of them, the most important ones, so of course 1948 and 67, the different wars between Israel and Palestinians and Arab countries, where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were, were expelled. In uh, 1990, uh, when Kuwait invaded, invaded Iraq, uh, the PLO, or at least uh, Yasser Arafat at this time, took position with the uh, Saddam Hussein, and so the Kuwait decided to expel. Uh, around 350,000 Palestinians were expelled at this time. They were uh, working in, in Kuwait. Of course, they had no legal rights to any kind of legal rights uh, in Kuwait, so they were expelled. In 1995, uh, Libya decided to expel the Palestinians who were working there because they disagree, the Libyan government was di disagree with the Oslo Agreement, so with the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. So they expel the Palestinians and tell them, you have a country now, so you have to go back. So of course, it couldn't enter in the West Bank and, and, um, and the Gaza Strip. In 2003, with the fall of the Saddam Hussein regime, the same thing happens. There were around 40,000 Palestinians in Iraq. They were expelled by the new government. And now, in 2011, the, the Syrians, it happened another time, another conflict. 
And most of the time, the Palestinians in these different uh, examples, except for the first one, of course, were not involved, I mean, in the conflict. They were just, their expulsion were a consequence of an overall situation that they didn't choose, and they were not part of it. And this is um, uh, very interesting uh, in terms of a reflection of the vulnerability of the refugee status. I mean, when you have no right, when you have no state, uh, when you have no asylum rights, when you have no refugee law, uh, it means that you have no protection. Because one of the specificity of the UNRWA versus the UNHCR is that the UNHCR has a mandate of protection and assistance. But the, uh, UN, but, but, but the UNRWA has a very, very, very limited mandate of protection that was not existing at the creation in 1949 and was step by step implemented. But still, it has very, very limited legal protection of the refugees. So no possibility to protect them. And if we go to uh, what is a Palestinian refugee, what is the status of a Palestinian refugee today? As I told you, you have the UNHCR convention, you have the convention, 1951 convention with UNHCR that gives some rights and some definition of a refugee with protection and assistance. And on the other side, you have the Palestinians uh, who depends from the UNRWA. For the UNRWA, what is a Palestinian refugee? It's a person whose normal place of residence was Palestine during the period between June 1946 and May 48, and who lost both his home and means of livelihood as a result of the 1948 conflict. And all the descendants of these people are Palestinian refugees. But there is nothing linked to uh, persecution, to fear of persecution, uh, as the definition of the, uh, of the uh, convention. At the very beginning, there was a geographical limitation. It means that you, you are a Palestine refugee as long as you live in a country where UNRWA has offices. If you leave this country, then you lose all your rights. So a Palestinian who is registered, for example, in Jordan, if he leaves Jordan, he loses all his rights. And it's what is happening today with the Palestinian refugees from Syria. They were registered in Syria, so they have all their files and rights in Syria and assistance. But it's extremely complicated to transfer the files in another country. So they have very, very limited assistance linked to the fact that there is a ge geographical uh, 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 boundary that limits the assistance. And this is another problem of the definition of refugees with the UNRWA that it has limitation, it has a geographical limitation. So it's not valid everywhere. So it means, and this is something that I will develop more precisely a little bit later, it means that, of course, a Palestinian refugee is a refugee in Syria, but when he goes to Lebanon, he's not anymore a Palestinian refugee, he's a Palestinian refugee from Syria, a PRS, it's the way they are uh, de uh, designated. And when they go abroad, for example, those who reach Europe, they, have, they became asylum seekers, and they have to apply another time. They lose their refugee status. They became another time asylum seekers, and if they don't get the status, then they became illegal migrants. So the same person can be a recognized refugee in his country of first asylum, Syria, and step by step, all along his journey toward exile, he loses step by step his rights. From full rights in Syria to limited assistance in Lebanon or Jordan, then to become another time an asylum seeker or worse, an illegal migrant if he's not granted the refugee status. So this is one of the main, one of the main problems. One of the smallest problems inside this overall uh, <laughs> picture is that the refugee status is only given by male descendant. So you are a refugee, is your father is a refugee. The mother is not entitled to give you uh, her citizenship. 
So, for example, a Palestinian refugee who is married to a Syrian or to a Lebanese, the mother cannot give her nationality. So when the father dies, you have a whole problem of statelessness and what they call in Arabic bidun, it means that without, it means without. It's people who are without any kind of paper. They cannot prove their origin. And you have, generation by generation, you have read, uh, growing numbers of, of bidun, Palestinians, without any kind of papers. So they are not even stateless, and they cannot even access, uh, for example, uh, UNRWA assistance, because they cannot prove their own nationality, their own origin, their own identity. And this is a big, a big problem in many, many Arab countries. So, I mean, you have different levels of vulnerability, but of course, when it comes to war and when people are displaced, most of the people, they face more and more difficulties to prove. When you leave a country, when you leave Yarmouk without anything and all the papers have burned, it's extremely complicated for the people to just prove that they have a nationality, that they have an origin, that they have rights. And so, as long as mo the more they emigrate, the more they lose some of their rights, and the more they lose the possibility to prove that they have some rights. And of course, as you don't have asylum, asylum law in these countries, the problems become not a legal problem, but it, be, but it becomes a political problem. So the Palestinians are treated as political bodies and not as refugees in needs of protection or assistance. So their access or not to the territory, their access or not to some rights, uh, education, labor market, residency, uh, health, is the consequence of the relation between th their state of asylum and uh, it's a Lebanese-Palestinian relation that depends on how do they treat Palestinians. Uh, for example, some of the states like Jordan decided in 2013 to close the border to all the Palestinians coming from Syria, saying it, we are not a country of asylum for Palestinians. They have a Palestinian territory in Israel, so they have to go back there. And of course, it's impossible for them to enter, so they were trapped at the border, and nobody cares. They are not under the mandate of the UNRWA, that cannot protect them, and they are not under the mandate of the UNHCR. The only time when UNHCR had made an intervention was when the Palestinians were expelled from Iraq in 2006, and they were trapped at the border during two years in refugee camps in the no man's land between Iraq and Syria. And nobody wanted to make any kind of intervention. The Iraqi state said they are not Iraqis. The Syrians said they are Palestinians, they have to go back to, uh, to Palestine. And so it's the only time where the UNHCR made a resettlement program for them and managed to resettle like around 2,000 Palestinians. But it's the only time, the only example where UNHCR was involved in a Palestinian situation. It's because UNRWA has no mandate in Iraq, so it was a little bit easier for them to, to develop a, a, a possibility. Um, so what I wanted to show you in that in the very case of the Palestinians, it shows, uh, as it's written here, all these blurring categories. I mean, the same person, according to the place where he is, according to the step in his journey toward exile, experience different kinds of categories. But it's the same person, so the, the debate in Europe whether we, we, it's a refugee crisis, a migrant crisis, whether other illegal migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, is a debate that doesn't take into account that all these categories uh, uh, reflect the, the same experience of one person that crosses all these different categories along his journey. They are refugees, they are asylum seekers, they are migrants, they are illegal migrants, they are asylum seekers. That it, it, it depends on when do you catch them and in which step of the journey they are. So 
it's, it's a useless question to try to understand if the people are refugees or not. It's, it's another, I mean, the, the problem is more based on trying to understand the experience of the people more than to try to put them into, uh, into categories when these categories does not exist. And this is one of the main problems in the, in, in, in the Middle East where we have two, um, uh, the absence of the 1951 convention and the UNRWA that is existing with specific de uh, definition of the refugees. And now let's go to the, to the real case study that is the um, Palestinian refugees from Syria uh, in Lebanon. So uh, the problem became so important that um, they decided to open offices in all the different refugee camps in Lebanon specifically to give assistance to the Palestinian refugees uh, uh, from Syria. So this photo was taken in the south of Lebanon in the uh, city of Tyre where they have opened the center to try to collect data on these Palestinian refugees from Syria and try to give them assistance, to try to know where they live, what do they need, uh, and what kind of assistance they can give them. So you have now specific offices in all, in all Lebanon to try to, to reach this, uh, these people. And in practical term, today, what does it mean to be a Palestinian refugee from Syria in Lebanon? Uh, there has been a recent, um, a recent study, uh, a field work that has been done by the American University in Beirut uh, in collaboration with the UNRWA uh, on the situation of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. And the results are very uh, interesting. 90% of the Palestinian refugees from Syria are below the line of poverty in Lebanon. So it's, I mean, huge number, I mean, it's only 10% are above. Including in this 90%, you have 9% living in extreme poverty. I mean, the extreme poverty line, as they have been defined in this study, is that you face difficulties even to buy food. So you reach the level of not being able to buy food. So, and it's in Lebanon, Amir, it's, it's, it's not a poor country, it's a middle income country, uh, according to the World Bank. Uh, and if we compare it to the Palestinian refugees from Lebanon, that those who live since 1948, it's 65% of them who, are li who still live under the line of poverty. And this 65% are concentrated in the refugee camps. So it means that being and to live in a refugee camp uh, has direct consequences of your level of life and on poverty. One of the reasons why, the main reasons why they, they are in such a level of poverty, it's Palestinians have no access to the labor market in Lebanon. Since 1948, they are not allowed to work, except in very limited uh, categories of, of employment, such as uh, daily workers uh, uh, in the agriculture, in the construction sector, and so on and so forth. Uh, the price of accommodation is extremely high. You have to imagine that Lebanon was a country of 4 million and it became a country of 5 million in two years with the arrival of 1 million refugees. So of course the prices of accommodation rose extremely high and everything is becoming extremely expensive because you have 25% of the population more. And they have a very precarious legal status. It means that when you are an illegal migrant, when you are a Palestinian refugee from Syria and you cannot have a residency permit, you cannot get out of the camps or you are caught by the police. It means that you cannot reach assistance and you cannot work. So it means that you are trapped in a camp. And as soon as you go out, you can be caught by the Lebanese police and put in jail if you are lucky or put at the border if you are unlucky. It happens. Even if the Lebanese authorities, I have to say, has been quite, com I mean, have behaved uh, uh, quite well with the Palestinian refugees and there was not a lot of deportation, except in a very limited situation. But I mean, they, they were the fear of deportation, but they didn't deport the people. 
So uh, there was not a lot of deportation, but still it's something that is uh, existing and it's a possibility. This is the uh, geographical um, uh, uh, dispersion or concentration of the Palestinian refugees from Syria. So they are, most of them are in the main cities, of course. And the black areas in the circles means that uh, more than 50% of them are living in the refugee camps. So it's, they are concentrated where the poorest Palestinians were already concentrated. So you have to imagine what is happening now to these camps where the poverty was extremely important before 2011, and now you have an extremely poor population that comes and settles in a very poor uh, area with a lot of problems from infrastructure, water, electricity, schools, access to the health system, and so on and so forth. But I can go in details with questions if you are interested. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention uh, that is the other phase of asylum seeking and of refugeeness. We always talk about forced migration. People are forced to leave. But at least people can leave. When you are a forced migrant, it means that you manage to leave. The main problem for most of the Palestinian refugees today is forced immobility. They cannot move. So it's the other reality of forced migration. When you arrive in a place when you have no rights, one of the first rights that you lose is the right to move further away to get a status, for example, to arrive in Europe, ask for asylum, be granted the refugee status, and so begin in the process of having some rights. And these people are trapped in situations where they cannot move. They cannot move, they cannot access assistance, they cannot work, they cannot send their kids to school, they cannot go back to their country of origin because it's still on war. And this is the result of the gradual implementation of restrictive policies by the neighboring states to forbid the entry of new refugees from Syria. The first one who have been exposed to this restriction were the Palestinians. First of all, they restrict mobility and arrival of Palestinians. Meaning that most of the refugees that is shown on the slide arrived before 2013. After 2013, it was too late. Border was completely closed. It was still open to Syrian refugees, but not to Palestinians from Syria. So there was already a discrimination. And the same thing happened in, in Jordan. And so it broke all the different relations that were previously existing before 2011. As I mentioned here, family relations, so marriages between the different groups. You have to remember that all these people were scattered from only one country, so sometimes the same family. One member of the family in 1948 ended in Lebanon, the other ended in Syria, the third ended in Jordan, according to war. They couldn't choose the country where they were going to, and they thought that they would go back rapidly. That never happened. You had something else that is quite important in the Middle East, is tribal networks. I could go back to this on many examples if you're interested also, but it's a dimension that is not really developed uh, uh, and not really known uh, in Europe. And also previous migration experiences. So all the people were just coming back and forth, working in Lebanon, going back to Syria and so on and so forth. And these, all these movements have been stopped by the war in Syria. And so they were forced. It was a space of circulation with some restrictions, of course. It was not free circulation, but cross-border circulation was existing. And then the war had pushed a part of them into forced migration, and another part became from forced migrant to forced <coughs> non-migrants. And this is also another phase of, uh, because migration and mobility could be considered as um, something to escape poverty or to escape a situation of the absence of rights. But mobility is still not a right for these people, so they cannot access uh, mobility. So I think it's also interesting to think in the case of the Middle East and of the relation between 
Middle East and European Union about forced immobility versus forced migration. It's something that can be also discussed and, and can be thought a little bit uh, more. So this forced immobility led, of course, to uh, a very precarious legal st uh, status. Uh, they face now difficulties to renew even their residency, even if they were allowed to enter. At the very beginning, it was a three-month visa. It was free. And now it's restricted. You cannot enter. You have to pay $200 per person per year to extend the residency rights. Of course, for families, it's something that they cannot afford. Uh, the, ex the monthly expenditure of Palestinian refugees from Syria in Lebanon is around $140 per person per month. It's what they spend to live, to pay for food, accommodation, and so on and so forth. So $200 is just more than one month of expenditure. So when you have a family of five or six persons, it means that it's five, six months of expenditure that you have to spend only to have residency rights. So of course, many people cannot afford. So they became illegal migrants. Uh, so illegal stay, fear of deportation. Those who are illegal and in the refugee camp, they cannot go out of the refugee camps because they may, can be caught by the police. So their mobility is limited. They don't have access to assist, assistance when the assistance is given outside the camps. And it has a lot of restrictions, of course, on different kind of access to labor market, as I told you before, to schools and so on and so forth. So it's like uh, step by step the, with the protracted situation of the conflict, step by step, uh, the refugees are in a more and more vulnerable situation with less and less access to basic rights. Just to end uh, my presentation, I would just show you three slides with, with photos I took in several locations. This is in South Lebanon, in the, one of the biggest camp in South Lebanon, um, in Albat camp. It's um, uh, where, just to un make you understand what is a refugee camp today, this is a re Palestinian refugee camp. So it's, uh, it's a place that is like 15 to 16,000 inhabitants in this camp. And uh, to accommodate the new arrival of Syrian refugees and Palestinian refugees, the Palestinians uh, built new, um, new houses and they rented to the Palestinians, to, to, the new, to, to the newcomers, Palestinians or Syrians, of course. So it's a way for them to have more, uh, to have more money uh, because they are not allowed to work, of course. And uh, it's a way also that, that explains partly uh, this, the development of informal accommodation and of, of these informal buildings explain one of the reasons, it's one of the reasons why there was no real crisis in these countries and they, they managed to accommodate like one million uh, refugees very rapidly. It's because uh, most of the um, uh, uh, housing sector is informal. So there is like a flexibility. It's much more flexible than an official uh, um, uh, housing market, of course. This is the kind of uh, inside the camp. Uh, this kind of activity some of the Syrians managed to develop, and some Palestinians from Syria and Syrians. Um, uh, they have like, uh, uh, they took um, uh, like mobile uh, uh, shops and they sell many things inside the narrow streets of the camp. And they open some small shops, so the Palestinians just uh, give them this and they pay a rent to open a shop. So it's a way for them to develop activities because inside the camp uh, you are not controlled by the Lebanese authority. So inside the camp you can develop some kind of activity. And the last, uh, and the last picture is um, the one we are outside the camp in a completely informal settlement that it's a Palestinian informal settlement uh, from Bedouin origin with a lot of tribal links and, and tribal organization. If you are interested I can just elaborate more with the questions. And um, I wanted to show this because it's, uh, I wanted to finish on this, uh, just to, to show you the importance of, of, of diasporas 
when you have a refugee movement and a conflict. A half of the population from this Syrian, a Palestinian informal settlement, it's called Shabriha, it's in the South Lebanon, half of them are emigrated in Sweden, Denmark, and Germany. And so all these emigrants uh, built houses for them to come back during the holidays. So they sent money uh, to their family and they built new houses and so on and so forth. And so what happens in when the Syrians and the Palestinians from Syria arrived, uh, they rent these empty apartments to the newcomers, or even with some with tribal or family links, they even built, with the money of the diaspora, new houses to accommodate their relatives who were coming from Syria. So it's a form of solidarity, of transnational solidarity, that developed between the diaspora in Europe, the diaspora in the Gulf countries, and Lebanon. So it shows how, on the long term, you have transnational forms of solidarity that develops. And it's also a way to understand why such a large number of refugees can arrive in a country and how a country manages. Informality is one way, but also all these different kind of transnational solidarity network exist for the Palestinians, but also for the Syrians. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you've uh, commented on very different issues, so I guess we just take. Uh, hello. 